Good evening, everyone. This is Lucy Gray from Chicago with my TIE 575 students from National Lewis University. And we're really pleased to welcome the fabulous Teach42, AKA Steve Dembo, to our, our weekly webinar. Um, this is a course on staff development and we've been talking to people all quarter long on best practices in staff development. And uh, Steve's gonna share his expertise with us tonight. So Steve, um, thank you for coming and why don't you tell us a little bit about your background because you can tell it better than I would. <laughs> so, um... I, uh, from outside the Chicago, actually not far from Lucy, uh, Miss Gray. I don't know what you go by in your class, okay. Professor Gray. No, um, professor. no, no, don't call me Professor. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, started off teaching kindergarten and then, uh, you know, moved on uh, after several years to become a director of technology. I actually am a National Lewis alum, um, got my administration uh, um, and supervision from National Lewis, uh, my master's degree there. And then uh, went into where well, I always kind of planned to go the principal and route and go into administration. Instead, uh, I wound up uh, getting hired on by Discovery Education uh, to work uh, on their community team. And I always figured that would be kind of just a one year little stint. Turns out I enjoyed it, it was a good group. So I wound up uh, staying there for about 10 years. Um, during that time, I you know, wrote uh, some coursework for uh, Wilkes University and taught there. So I'm an adjunct professor there. Uh, I'm also uh, about five years in now uh, to uh, working on my uh, local school board, District uh, 69 in Skokie, Morton Grove. Um, so, you know, and then what also kind of evolved out of working for Discovery was uh, that, uh, you know, I really enjoyed doing uh, presenting. It wasn't something that I ever done before. I'd worked with teachers and done professional development in small groups at my school, um, but working with teachers at a larger scale um, was kind of something that uh, had never really, you know, kind of, you know, I never really had much of a chance to do it, never really sought it out, and it turns out I wound up enjoying it. So with Discovery, um, I wound up spending a lot of time uh, doing presenting for groups, but also creating uh, opportunities um, for people to uh, get trained in education and, uh, and so on, um, creating a variety of PD types of experiences beyond just the normal ones. One of my big challenges is what do you do when everybody has gone to in-service days, everybody's been to conferences, and not only that, but you're also managed, overseeing a community of about 100,000 educators. How do you give them high quality uh, PD experiences that really make them feel energized, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, inspired, um, and also give them the content that they need to actually really make a difference. So, you know, uh, I was part of creating a lot of uh, different types of PD experiences, whether those be face-to-face, -face, whether they be virtual, whether they be blended, and so on, creating literally new models and so on. Um, and have spent a good portion, uh, uh, not just doing PD, um, but also trying to come up with uh, different types of structures. And such. So, so this is like perfect. I didn't even think about that because I know I, I should know, I know what you've done at Discovery. So I, but I didn't think about it in that lens. So that's <clears throat> you're the perfect person to have right now. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to say about Discovery is we've talked about teacher communities that that companies are producing whether that's a little bit like the google certified innovator program the apple distinguished educator program and those the ade program i particularly think i look at as a, kind of an elite thing because 50 people get it every two years right and it's kind of a mystery how people are picked and that sort of thing um and it used to be um it used to be that you had to be nominated by somebody at Apple. I was the last class that you had to be nominated by somebody at Apple and then you applied and then you got in, hopefully. Right. Um, and now anybody can apply, fortunately. It's a little bit better. But um, those programs are, are, are pretty elite. And what I always loved about the Discovery Educator Network was that it was really inclusive. It welcomed everybody. There were different levels of participation. You could go gung-ho with it or you could just be kind of lurking in the background. It was up to you what you made of the experience. Right. And, and the DEM people have been so enthusiastic in general. And, and so um, A, tell us a little bit about that. And B, is there like a hashtag or anything that we can follow for DEM people? Um, 
Yeah, so for Den, um, you know, a lot of people just tag things with Discovery Ed or there's the hashtag DEPD, Discovery Education Professional Development. Um, a lot of people use those. One of the other larger ways that you can connect with them is the Facebook group, uh, Den Friends, um, DEN, Discovery Educator Network. That's the name of the community. We, we early on decided, I mean, we looked at the Apple, the ADDE model and did consider that one. At the time, we, we predated Google and most of the other major evangelist programs. Uh, Apple was one of the early, early ones. Um, we decided to go, the, you know, Apple always made it a, a really big deal for the people that got through, that got, you know, that, that, that were able to become an ADDE. You know, it's a, it's a major, major honor, but not, I mean, pure and simple. They're, they're, even if there's a thousand people that are qualified, only 50, like you said, every two years get in. We decided to go the Statute of Liberty approach, which was we will welcome everybody with open arms, no matter what level you're at. And our goal is to, um, to help you level, you know, get connected with the people that you need and to help level you up. The only commitment that you had uh, is uh, that you would do what we said, what we called reporting events. In other words, if you learn something from us, like for example, at a webinar like this, your commitment is that you're gonna take it and you're gonna turn it around and share it with other people. That's the action, sort of a train the trainer model, but not necessarily anything that formal. And so long as you report in that you got a group of people together and said, hey, let's grab some coffee and talk about digital storytelling or something like that. As long as you report in that you did that, like I think it's literally only twice per year, it's enough. Now, what we found was some people would do it much, much more than twice per year. We didn't necessarily make it all about discovery education, but here's the reality. You know, if discovery is kind of the hub, it's going to wind up coming up quite a bit. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, lest anybody kid themselves, you know, Google, Apple, uh, you know, Z uh, uh, Kahoot or whoever else has one of those programs, they have ulterior motives for why they're doing it. And of course, they, it's marketing, it's PR, it's press, it looks good to the board and so on and so forth. But that doesn't diminish the fact that some of these companies are really providing some excellent opportunities for educators and that you can get some really, really good uh, training and connections and so on out of it. So, And, and, and FYI to the people in the audience, um, uh, there's been some um, articles in the New York Times over the past couple months <coughs> about these programs that have been a little controversial. And yes. I would say, uh, uh, I think some, I think there's some, I, I, I do think something weird is going on in ed tech where, uh, people are, um, I don't know, they're becoming a little sold out and it's different. You know, when I really got to know Steve back in 2006, we were part of this blogging and tweeting community at Twitter was actually not, I don't think, and, but we were all blogging and writing and sharing our work and meeting up at ed tech conferences. And we all felt, I think, a sense of community. And, uh, and, and that's changed. It's become more well, segmented. I'm not so sure it's necessarily changed, but I think a lot of people have realized it can also be profitable. Yeah. And We're not, uh, there are some people. We're not in schools anymore either. Yeah, a lot of people are able to turn it into a business and honestly, more power to them. There are also lots and lots of people who are still just doing it for the, the, the good of education, the good of the community. And honestly, I will say this, all of them contribute. Yes, that's true. So, yeah. So, so it gets to be, so there's like a, there's a little fine line about this sort of thing. And, and I think people look at it in different ways. Some people are, don't care. Other people do care. I think in education, people do get a little weirded out by for-profit in schools because it traditionally hasn't gone together. So I it's, think that you just need to be, you need to be honest about it. Like the people who are doing it need to be honest about it. And the people who are attending need to understand that there may be an ulterior motive. And at least you can file that back away in the back of your head. I can promise you one thing. If we bring 100 educators or 150 educators out to Chicago for a full week of professional development, I can promise you there will be some discovery plugs. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. at the same time, it's also five days of professional development. So. Yeah, it, it, 
there's a balance. There's a, there, there's going to be a little bit of, a little bit of each. And so long as you're upfront and honest about that, and so long as you go into it knowing that you're not blindsided by it, I, 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 I think it's okay. I think, um, where, I think where it gets a little weird is like the article I put in here, there's a teacher who like gets her whole wardrobe paid for by a company that that's a little too much for me. So yeah. anyway. I just think it's kind of well, like, and I will say this: there have been some people that have said we want you to represent us at this event or to do this or this kind of thing. Where I've had to turn them down because it wasn't something that I necessarily believed in. It's not something that I wanted to be able to represent. And you know, at the end of the day, you I feel like there's a relationship there, and you have to be able to trust the person who's in front of you. And if you can't trust them, well, then then, then anything else that they say it's going to be hard to take seriously. It's going to be hard to react to and so on. Um, we're getting a little bit like sort of uh, into a different zone than what I thought we were going to be talking about. But at the same time, I think it, it definitely still ties in, especially when you're talking about professional development, especially in the ed tech world, which I think more than other spheres. Um, I mean, yes, some, I guess every sphere is kind of in influenced by the big companies and so on and so forth somewhat. But I think it's so easy to bribe someone with a makey makey or with a 3D printer or something else along those lines versus some of those other ones. It's, it's a little bit harder to bribe someone with a digital textbook. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not the same cachet. Not well, quite I, a sexy, well, you know? <laughs> my, my son has something to say about it, but uh, I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah. so, I, I, I didn't mean to hijack. I just, no, I, no, it's I, good. I, I, the den has been, such a positive force i see with i see people participating in it i think i applied and was one theoretically but then i wasn't working somewhere that had done the discovery so i just kind of faded yep. but if you guys are looking to get involved with a, a really good group of people this is one place that you might want to consider the one thing that I can honestly say with with that i love is every single person who works on the community um, is an educator is someone who started off as a classroom teacher or someone else along those lines. So the, from, you know, there are some times where you get a marketing person who is running the community and it has a very different vibe. Um, we, uh, the, the, the discovery one, that, that's one thing that I like about it, but I'll be honest. The other thing is I really do think they're really committed to tr trying to do good work and provide good PD and so on. I mean, and th that's kind of one, like I said, you know, that's one of the things to, that reasons why I love doing that was coming up with these different models of PD and trying to come up with different events, things that are going to inspire those same people who have been to every conference, who have been to 30 ed camps and so on. How do you challenge someone like that? How do you stretch them? You know, um, and for the people who have never been to an ed camp or don't know what an ed camp is, I don't know whether any of you uh, do and we can define it. If you don't know what an ed camp is, throw that into the chat and we'll, we'll define it. But for those people that haven't been to something like that, how do you support them, get them to buy in and elevate them to the point where they're the ones who are leading ed camps themselves? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, that's sort of a kind of an interesting, uh, you know, experience to me. So that's awesome. So actually, can I ask, I, mean, I see, all right, so it looks like uh, Maya or Mia, is it Maya? It's Mia. Maya? Mia. Uh, there's Mia, there's Stephanie, there's, uh, oh, I'm going to totally butcher this one, Marisa, and then Laura and Tori. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you uh, what was your, if looking back on your educational career, your experiences so far, what personally was the best PD event that you've, or PD experience that you've ever had? Mia, you wanna start? Well, this is a very difficult question to consider because before I went to the Illinois Computing Educators Conference this past year, I would have told you that the best professional development experience I had ever had was going to ed camps actually because of the autonomy involved, uh, being able to choose where one wants to go within the sessions, being able to decide what the sessions were going to be, the lack of salesmanship, so to speak. Um, obviously, there were still sponsors, but there wasn't this pressure of looking at particular items for um, purchasing. Um, but going to the Illinois Computing Educators Conference, uh, 
felt very invigorating. It was wonderful to meet people from all over the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to be going to ISTE this year as well too, the International Society for Technology and Education. And that is international. So uh, I can't really say at this point, what is the best professional development experience I've had since I'm looking forward to this conference as well. Fair enough. Um, Stephanie, what about you? If you're there and you can find the mute button fast enough. I'm here, sorry. No problem. Uh, I haven't gone to a whole lot of conferences, um, professional development wise, like ones that come with CPDUs, but the best one I have for like technology integration, I've had, um, it was just a coworker, we were co-teaching and he taught me how to use um, different things on the smart board and different things with smart clickers through working together. Um, for actual like um, professional development, uh, I go to a conference called MMC every year. It's Math, uh, Metropolitan Math Club of Chicago. Um, and you get to pick your sessions. So I always pick ones that are geared towards the classes I teach. Um, mm -hmm. And so I get a lot of projects and great ways to like redo my reviews and things that I can do with my students that I've actually used in my classroom. Excellent. Um, and yeah, just, just what, what she was just saying in terms of, you know, the, the co-worker, the co-teacher. Yeah, this doesn't need to necessarily, you don't need to, it doesn't need to be a formal experience. I guess any sort of, well, you know, when I say professional development, I mean, anytime you're learning about whatever, you know what I mean? Um, well, you can take that wherever you want to. Uh, Mar Mareza, I'm totally butchering that name and I apologize. She goes by Maria, I believe. Maria. Silent Z. Okay, Maria. Yeah, it's Maria. Um, so I will share my very first time um, actually learning more about technology in depth was three years ago at an event that was hosted by one of the um, Chicago Public Schools in the South Side, which I cannot remember the name, but the name of the event was Google Palooza. And so there I was introduced to Twitter, Instagram, and other features about social, uh, I'm sorry, um, Facebook. And one thing that I liked about um, the Google Drive and everything under, under Google was learning about the Google Drive, sharing other, um, all kinds of documents with all kinds of hyperlinks. And we went into um, the hyper, hyper um, docs, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I thought it was pretty amazing because it was at a global um, point of, of sharing all kinds of resources, not only within Chicago, but in that same PD, we were able to interact with others outside of the United States. So it was a global, yeah. And so that's where my passion for educational technology was born, if I could say that. That's fantastic. I think I, I've been to a couple of Google Paloozas. I may have, I know Lucy said she was at uh, one, uh, maybe that same one. I might have been there too. I'm not sure. Um, thank you. I appreciate that, Maria. Yes, um, APS used to do a tech talk, and I think it turned into Google Palooza. It ended up being more, and I used to go around and interview teachers for the award that they gave there. Um, but I don't know if I, I don't know if I've actually been to a Google Palooza. But the, I think that's what TED Talks morphed into Google Palooza. I think. You might be right. Um, how about Erica? So this is my first year uh, going to PD because last year my school um, didn't fund that for me. So I haven't been to that many, but I have a feeling that ISTE this summer will be my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, but besides that, a course I took through this program like as an elective was Google Apps for Educators and it kind of felt like a four week long PD and I really enjoyed it because, and that's what like kind of got me hooked on, uh, I guess, Google apps and just using tech in the classroom. Fantastic. Um, Tori. Hi. Um, I will say I'll probably piggyback off a lot of people, but basically any PD where I really get hands-on and get to experience the learning is ones I really enjoy. So like ed camps, 
the first time I went to an ed camp, I was just so shocked at the setup that it really hit home to me. And that's where I learned about Genius Hour. And Genius Hour has become my passion. So I really took that home with me. And from there, I wanted to learn about makerspaces. So every time I saw something about makerspaces out there, I did a seminar through NLU. Um, anything where I can really be hands-on with things I really enjoy. Fantastic. All right. I'm trying to, I, I realized after like the first couple, thank you, Tori. I appreciate it. At, at, after the first couple, I realized I probably should have been writing down the names. So if I uh, miss somebody, please let me know. Did we do Steph Stephanie, did you go already? We Stephanie went already. Um, Laura, you need to pick on Laura. Laura. Wait, no, we had Laura, I thought. No, I didn't hear no, Laura. Laura. Okay, Laura. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. <laughs> Um, okay, so I have been home for the last couple of years, so I've been out of the classroom for a while. And prior to that, um, I would say that the district I was in, was, a lot of our PD was um, centered around Common Core for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, I would say the best um, pre-Common Core, the best PD that I had was um, in district with, um, we, there was one type of a uh, few in-service days that we did where um, we were just given a like a whole slew of things we could choose from from colleagues that we were trying and there were a couple of um, courses that I went to uh, where our tech integration specialists were doing trying some new tech things and um, it was probably the best in-service days I had because Everybody in there wanted to be in there. We were trying out new things. We had all of all these new iPads, you know, because this was pre one to one initiatives, and um, it was it was a really cool experience. And uh, nobody told us we had to go to any specific class, and that was by far the best PD. Then Common Core came along, and that all went away. <laughs> mm hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm making some notes as we go along, so I'm going to be able to come back to it. Um, but I want to make sure that we get everybody a chance. Is there anybody we, we missed? I think we got everybody. We got me, got everybody? Laura, Tori, Erica. Maya. All right, perfect. Um, so this is what's kind of interesting. I, so I was jot, trying to jot down notes as we went along, but here are some of the themes that I heard. People like that camps because they like being able to customize their own experience. Um, the personalization of working with a coworker who taught her how to so use so, something very concrete and uh, 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 directly applicable to what she did. She really liked that one. But then also going to the MMC conference and being able to pick sessions that were directly applicable. The Google Palooza, learning about Twitter and Instagram. And this was, you were the only one who mentioned uh, interacting with others outside of the US and extending ending the connections, uh, which is kind of interesting too. Um, we heard someone mention hands-on, something I get to experience, something concrete, and uh, being able to pick and choose and be able to attend sessions uh, based on what my interests were. I wanted to know more about makerspaces. I was able to go into to a session about that. And then, uh, you know, the last one uh, was uh, where the best PD day was when they put out a whole bunch of really cool types of stuff or made a whole bunch of offerings, and we chose to opt in. But the only people who were there were the people who wanted to be there and you get to self-select the things that you wanted to go to. You're seeing some themes between all of these things. Good PD, the stuff that sticks with you is the stuff that you're passionate, that you're invested, that you've bought into. It, the, the, the worst PD, we could go around and do this again and ask, talk about the worst PD experience, but more often than not, the common theme tends to be Somebody said we all had to learn about brain research and they brought in an expert about brain research and it didn't have anything to do with what I do as a kindergarten teacher or a math teacher or a PE teacher and so on. But we all had to learn it because that's what the district was doing. But I also knew that if I just survived it in two years, the district would be doing something different. So I would just smile and nod. Do you know what I mean? That, 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 that tends to happen. The other thing that I thought was a very interesting common theme was... Not one of you, actually, I'm sorry, one of you. One of you did say that they really enjoyed the elective course that they were taking through here, uh, but then went on to talk about something else as well. Nobody said that the best PD experience you've ever had was a webinar. 
or that TED Talk that you watched online or that live stream that you saw. Why is that? Why didn't any of you say it was? You know, well, I, nobody said, of course, I had it at NLU. <laughs> But like, but like, so any, anybody want to just say like, well, or so Erica did say, she said there was an elective. Oh, that's true. That's true. That's right? true. Sorry, Erica. Props to that. <laughs> but beyond that, like why, what, what's the difference between, even if you were able to self-select your class, why wouldn't, why doesn't webinar rate quite as high as being elbow to elbow with somebody in my classroom in front of a smart board? Maybe what do, you, what do you think? Anybody want to take that? Me, my? The interaction aspect, maybe. Um, uh, so, you know, with that face-to-face -face tactile connection, it can be easier to read facial expressions. There's also that kinesthetic sense. But, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love this. We live in the future in Star Trek where we can talk and be wherever we want and be comfortable. But there is something to be said about that kinesthetic interaction. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? I I also think there's less distraction if you're face to face. Like right, being on the webinar, I could turn my microphone off and play with a dog or go on a different website to look up research based on what someone said and miss what they're saying. Well. I'm glad you said look up research based on what they said and didn't say solitaire, you know? <laughs> or I'm eating my dinner. Right. It's absolutely valid. Anyone else? It, you're hitting it right on the point. I mean, there, there is something fundamentally different, a different vibe, a different energy, a different buzz that people get when they're face to face. I, they I, do. I, I, I think the people, well, I'm not sure about everybody in this class, but I think another thing that's really uh, hit home for me this year is access to professional development. Um, and maybe because maybe the teachers who are in the Chicago metro area who are going to ed camps or their, t their schools are doing something or they ha they've been to ICE, they, they feel like they have enough opportunities at their doorstep. So a webinar is not that exciting. Yeah. Um, that could be it, one piece of it. Um, with our global ed conference, which is all webinars, uh, we have people from like new, the middle of nowhere, New Mexico or Montana saying to us, thank you because this, we would never be able to go see people like this where we live, where it's too far out and remote. So, you know, because we're more of an urban, you know, group here, you know, I, maybe we take it for granted that we can go down to the University of Chicago and go to a lecture if we wanted to, not that we do, or we can, we can do all these different things. Um, the other piece too about webinars is I think it has to be somebody pretty compelling to get a good audience. So, you know, Steve, my partner used to do uh, the future of education series where he would interview people about books and things like that. And I thought that had kind of a draw because there were pretty big names that he would get. Um, yeah. But now everybody's doing webinars, so maybe the cachet is kind of like, so, you know, big deal. So what, you know? See, the Global Ed Conference is absolutely phenomenal, and the content is amazing. And, you know, especially for those people that can't get information like that, for them, that might be literally the top of the, the webinar thing. What you were just saying in terms of there being competition, you know, when people have access to a lot of other opportunities, it may not necessarily rate as highly. Here's the thing, though. I'm not so sure it's necessarily one or the other. There is immense power in this kind of distance learning. There's a huge amount of relevance. There's a huge amount of power in being able to do that. The fact is, it would be very hard for us all to get in one room. But we can do this. And we can do this in a way that I can still have dinner with my kids and have seen my daughter's concert, you know, just an hour ago. However, that said, I think there still does need to be some, some sort of an acknowledgement that it may not be as motivating. It may not be as inspirational and buzzy, if you will, as when you can do the same thing face, you know, face to face, hand to hand and so on. The reason why I'm kind of harping on it is once you recognize that there's a fundamental difference between those two, then you can start to try and play with the models themselves and try and say, how can we make the webinar experience or the live stream?
stream experience be more like a face-to-face. -face. One of the things that we did at Discovery is we hosted something called a VertCon, and the big thing about it was we used to have around 3,000 people attend, and 1,500 of them were attending at viewing parties. We made a very big deal out of it. We tried to support them. We helped them organize. We helped them market. We helped send them door prizes and so on so that these people would get together they put it up on the screen and they'd watch it but they'd watch it with other people so they could turn to somebody else and say does that sound awesome to you or not you know what i mean so you kind of get the best of both worlds so especially if you work in a larger district webinar may be or this type of pd may be the most effective way to spread word around or pre-recorded webinars or pre-recorded video may be a very effective way to teach someone how to use Google Apps. But if you don't provide them that concrete follow-up, that hands-on experience that you guys were mentioning, or that opportunity to kind of connect with each other, or that, that, that element of choice, you know, if you don't tie in some of those things that you guys just described, then you're gonna lose power, you're gonna lose effectiveness, you know? I totally agree. I think, yeah. I don't think face-to-face -face is going away. And I think also with our global ed stuff, when we've been able to meet people in person, like a lot of the people come to ISTE, not a lot, but several people have come from Australia or South Africa or Ireland or whatever, and we get the chance to meet them then it's more powerful for sure. I think relationships matter. I think face-to-face -face matters. Um, the other thing this is making me think about is, is National Lewis. And I, in all honesty, um, I, I, I feel like the, and I, the program I went through was fine. I liked my cohort a lot. I had some good friends that came out of it. Uh, I think a lot of good educators have come out of this, this TIE program. Um, but what has, what has National Lewis done with that, with that alumni? And, and, and how are we having experiences that are innovative? I, I just haven't seen it, to, a lot of innovation around how the program is gone. And I taught for a number of years face to face and then just came back to the online piece last year. So there was a gap in things and they're mostly online now. That's my impression is most of their cohorts are online. So this year I was thinking about this course and I thought it would be really cool to do like an online, uh, either a face to face ed camp type thing at one of the NLU campuses or do a online symposium where like my students would show off their work and anybody else in the class would, could also join in. It, yeah. it had to be too much for me to do by myself kind of thing. Yeah. But I still think that's something like, I would love to see National Lewis do something that, uh, you know, the value also, um, you know, I've gone to, I, I was telling my students at the beginning, I think of this course, or maybe the last course they had with most of them had with me about how I went to Harvard. Um, I, have a, I know Chris Didi pretty well, who's a professor there and a friend TAs for him. And so I, was, I dropped in one summer when I was in Boston to a, a lecture they had by this guy from something Dragon. It's like the world, Net Dragon. It's the world's largest mm -hmm. uh, company. It was the CEO of the company talking about some new ed tech product they had. And I thought, this is what going to Harvard does for you. It gives you access to people like this. Whereas at National Lewis, I don't know if we have people like that could drop me in every day, right? And so one of the reasons I've had this series is to kind of give people some exposure to the other thinkers and people that are out there um, in, a, in a not quite the same vein, but I'm doing the best I can. Um, but so I think that's what going to a fancy school will do is give you access also to an alumni network. And we have some amazing alums. I forgot that you had gone to National Lewis until tonight. You know, like, why are we not leveraging that and, and doing something with it? I mean, it just seems like a lost opportunity. So I'll shut up with that. But oh, well, no, I, think, I think what you're describing is the norm. There are very few people that are really doing that kind of stuff very, very, very well. And I will say it's within the ed tech space. It's within the school space. It's just across the board. Um, you know, the, the, the people who uh do community well reap huge benefits from it but it is it, it's hard to do well and it usually doesn't happen accidentally or just organically um it usually takes a champion and it's the same thing with good professional development good professional development does not happen accidentally it requires somebody to step up and to have vision for it and to um to to you know to to cheerlead it if you will um so you know it, it, it's funny how often I talk to somebody at conferences or at events or even at schools that when I hear what they're doing in the class, 
that are doing something that is incredibly exceptional. I know that other people would get a kick out of it, would benefit from it, would be genuinely excited and put this person up on a pedestal. And when I say, why ha are you sharing this at the conference? Are you presenting this? Have you done an in-service on this? Have you shared this at the faculty meeting or anything like that? Most of them say, no, it's just what I do. They don't necessarily see that what they're doing is exceptional. Um, and sometimes it takes a little prodding for somebody to say, all right, well, maybe that what maybe the things that I consider average are actually share worthy. It's a big hump. It's a big, uh, here's one trouble that I have with educators in general. Educators are far too modest. They are far too modest and they are, feel genuinely uncomfortable saying, I'm doing something that's kind of awesome. You know what I mean? And so that's one reason why I like things like ed camps. I like casual models of professional development because I think they give more opportunities for somebody when it's in an informal setting. It gives more of an opportunity for somebody to stand up and say, well, I can't, I can't say I'm an expert, but here's what I do. And sometimes that's enough. Um, there's a lot of different models that give opportunities to do that. And honestly, it sounds silly, but I find that adding some sort of artificial construct helps lower that barrier to people participating. People like goofy, silly, like artificial. Here, I'll give you an example, okay? Um, in Texas, uh, I went to a school where the, one of the things that they do for PD is they call, they have Tech Mex Tuesdays. Tech Mex Tuesdays is every Tuesday afternoon. You can, you, there's two things that are guaranteed. Somebody is gonna be sharing something that they think is awesome and there will be chips and salsa. That's it. So people can come in, they're not required to, but they can come in, after school, they can have some chips and salsa. The only ask is that you give it at least 15 minutes. Give it 15 minutes just to hear what's going on. And if after 15 minutes you think this doesn't apply to you, you, you hightail it out of there. But if it does hook you, then you hang around and you share and you, you explore and you, you check it out and so on. Um, your app hours is another one. Uh, Alice Keeler's Coffee Edu. Coffee Edu is what's what's the concept? We're gonna get together. We're all gonna have coffee, and maybe we'll talk about some education stuff. It's a PD session, and it, it's a, the framework is we're going to get together and have coffee, and we're not gonna be inside the school when we do it. We're gonna be outside the school. And we're gonna be sitting down. It's gonna be chill, and there's gonna be zero expectations. All it is is an artificial construct, um, but it works but it works, you know what I mean? And there's so many of those. The other one I like is the, the speed geeking one. Speed geeking is where you have like six different people that might have something to share and you split the group in, you know, so you put them kind of like poster sessions around the room, you split the group into six and they get each person, each like small group goes and hears a two minute pitch from each person about what they want to share, what they're excited about, whether that be maker spaces, whether that be apps, whether it be iPads, whether it be whatever, augmented reality. And you go around and you hear a two minute pitch from each one of them. So that's like 12 minutes right there. And then you self select and you say which one I'm into and you go back and you follow up with that one. That's when you get your deeper dive. But this way you're not feeling the pressure to, uh, to, to sit in a one hour session because based on the description you thought it was going to be cool and then you found out that it wasn't. You know what I mean? And once again, they're all the same, but yeah. Let me, let me show you one thing. Can I just show you one quick thing and then whoever wants to talk? Um, this is something that you guys should all look at. I think this is the right uh, website. Yes, it is. So joyprofessionallearning.org. This is from a bunch of ADEs. I mentioned them before. One of them talked to us in one of my previous courses. I don't know if it was last summer or the previous version of this class. Um, but they've done iBooks on, on different ways, on every kind of professional development you can think of, um, from informal to formal to how to you know, different kinds of activities you can do within a professional development workshop. There's, they've done like 10 books here and they're all free from what I understand that you can download on Kindle or on iTunes. So if you guys, as you're planning your, your, your benchmark projects, take a look at this. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing resource, but it just made me think of um, what you're talking about. Steve just made me think of, uh, of, uh, of this, uh, you know, of having some kinds of, 
different ways to kick it up a notch. And I like their analogy of it, of these are, these are recipes, you know, for, for doing professional learning. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like, you may, if you're doing a training or you need to do, uh, you know, some sort of PD or you just have something that you think is worth sharing, you know, it's so funny how if you say, I'm going to do a one hour in service on it, the type of reaction that you will get versus we're going to be hosting a tech max Tuesday. Like it just from a very human perspective, you will trigger different responses in the brain. And to me, that's very important because when you say there's going to be an in-service on Tuesday, most people immediately start having a negative reaction. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it's been. It's just what most people uh, associate with those words. Um, and anything you can do to break that right from the get-go to demonstrate that this isn't going to be like that, that this is going to be different, helps. You know, it, it can be uber simple. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. One of my favorite things to do, and this actually goes all the way back to one of my first uh, informal – in fact, I'm, this might even actually be my very first non-traditional PD experience. There was something here in Chicago called Blog Walk. And I kind of crashed. There was a bunch of legal and business bloggers that were talking about, like, the professional end of blogging and all this. Oh my God, this goes back, like, 10 years, more than that, 15 years. Um, and here's all it was. We, we sat down. We had a conversation. We did some brainstorming. And then we put on – this was in the middle of winter in Chicago. We put on our, our coats, and we went for a walk in the middle of January amongst all the snow. And we spent the next hour walking and talking about the things that, you know, we were kind of – uh, brainstorming about uh, earlier and fundamentally it changes the nature of the conversation there is something about um the i mean they're actually to be honest there's brain research about it that shows when you, you did, your brain is more active when your body is active at the same time it is you know fundamentally when you're sitting down right now at a webinar and just listening to me yammer on while other things are going on you're in a nice comfy chair your brain gets into that sort of that beta phase and so on and so forth um, when you're actually up and walking. I used to do this for my, in, I, I ran an innovation and strategy team for discovery education, the internal one. And one of the things that I required was um, for, uh, we, we would have uh, two meetings per month. One of the meetings, you were not allowed to be at your desk. I didn't care where you were. You just couldn't be at your desk. You had to be at a coffee shop. You had to be outside. You had to be walking around. You had to be biking. Some people would put in headphones uh, or an earpiece and actually but like take the conference call while biking. I didn't care where it was. There's just, it, when you have a regular conference call and a regular meeting at your desk and so on, you treat it differently than when you're out and about. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Does that make, I hope that makes sense this to people. really good advice, I think. Um, I'm wondering, guys, we have, I, we have a few minutes left, and Steve is so good and creative with this stuff. I'm wondering if we could take some questions from you guys or, and or could you tell them what you're, what you're thinking about doing for your professional learning experience and see if you have any suggestions or, I don't know, let, let's use them while we have them here to, to get some feedback on things or just ask them a question in general. Let's see if we can do that. All right, I'll start, but my question's random. Sure, does, does that's the best kind. Does Teach42 stand for something? What do you think it stands for? Um, I don't know. Uh, no 40, free association? 42 is the meaning of life from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay, you're on there. You, you, you're on the right path. Have you read those books? I saw the movie years ago. Yeah, uh, close enough. Um, I, actually, I'm not positive whether the, the, the story was in the movie or not. Uh, but the way the story goes, if you've read the books, um, the Earth is basically a giant supercomputer to calculate. It's been running for 10 million years trying to calculate the answer to life, the universe, and everything. The ultimate answer. The ultimate answer. That's what it's trying to figure out. And after 10 million years, it finally gets ready to spit it out and yes, it was Jackie Robinson's uh, number. Um, 
it gets ready to spit it out and they have this whole big ceremony and party and all that and the computer says the ultimate answer is 42. And everyone looks at each other and they say, well, I don't get it. What does that have to do with anything? And goes, well, do you know what the ultimate question is? And they say, well, no, not really. He goes, well, maybe you should build another computer to figure out what the ultimate question is and then the answer will actually make sense. And that always kind of stuck with me because especially right now, I feel like the answers themselves are almost too easy to get. You know, she was, uh, Lucy, you were just asking, wasn't uh, Jackie Robinson's baseball number or was this someone's baseball number? Um, and I'm assuming you Googled the answer and you got it immediately just like that. <sighs> that's not, not, basically what it shows is that's not necessarily a good question anymore. And isn't that what we need to do as educators is to formulate, to teach kids to ask good questions, the kinds of questions that don't have an easy answer, the kinds of questions people are going to struggle with and try and figure out, you know? There, there is a, um, one of my favorite resources for that type of thing um, is rightquestion.org, which is a group out of uh, Cambridge. I'll put their link in here. They have some good stuff in here. FYI, speaking of questions. Love it. I think it's hard. I think it's one of those things I've always kind of struggled with is, you know, hypothetically, if I want to ask you guys a question to get you talking and to get your feedback and to inspire you and to get you to work hard, if I really want to give you something you're going to be able to dig into and spend the next three weeks working on, what's, how do you formulate that question? And this also goes back to what Gary Steger was telling us in PD, you start with a really good prompt. Yeah. And um, so this is this is building on our stuff. This is this has been really this has been good for me. I hope it's been good for my students. But this has been all these webinars have helped me kind of think through some of the things that I do for sure. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Who's next? Come on, be brave. <laughs> I like that one. I like the you know, they don't necessarily have to be on this kind of stuff at all. I'll be honest. And I don't think I knew that either, Steve. I don't know where, I don't know what, all these years, I, what have I been thinking about Teach 42? I, Who knows? Thank you, Tori, for asking that. <laughs> I'll ask another question. Um, so schools sort of require sometimes certain PDs. If you were to go to a school that was requiring something, I don't know, let's just go with the buzzword right now, uh, Common Core, some sort of Common Core PD, how would you go about making that so teachers that have to be there kind of want to be there and take something away from it? Do you feel like people have a positive uh, association with Common Core? I think it depends on the teacher. Okay. But in, in general, if we're going to make a blanket statement. Um, I think it's better than what teachers were used to. But I do think that some are phasing out of Common Core already, too. This is the kind of the way that I would start it off. I'll, I'll be honest. I, I might even just sit down and start it off and say, we're, if we got to learn about the Common Core, let's start off with what's, what's, what's awful about it? What's wrong with it? What's, what, what, what is it missing? What do our students need? that isn't reflected in here, and what in here is overbroad, imprecise, inaccurate, what isn't addressing the thing, you know, you know uh, what's missing and what's wrong. And in order to do that, you have to almost become an expert at it. Do you know what I mean? And what I think that also would help do is give people in a sense, a sense of ownership, it means that you're not going to treat Common Core as oh, Common Core. You know what I mean? Like you know something that came, you know that came down with Moses from the mountaintop, but as something that's living and breathing, and something that, as a community and as a group of professionals, you can take ownership of. You know, we get at, as a school board, we get press updates, which are recommendations for all the changes to school board policies, and we get them. We review every single one and say, they recommend you change, make this change. Do we believe it? And if we don't, we, we change it ourselves. So I think what a lot of people don't like about Common Core 
is just quite simply the fact that the locus of control is external, that it's being pushed down on them, that it's just one more thing and they don't necessarily feel that relevancy. So if I had to do a PD on it, the first thing I would try and do is make sure that I structure it in a way that they feel a sense of ownership. And demystifying it a little bit too, I think is helpful. Um, it's interesting because like in other countries, there's not, people don't balk at a national curriculum. And this is very far from a national curriculum. Like, like in Ireland, everybody thinks their national curriculum is good and worthy and they provide a good education for kids. You know, uh, so it's really interesting when you, you start looking at other countries and how they interpret this sort of thing. In really common course, it was, I think my impression was that it was meant to be guidelines and, and, and there was some room for interpretation and in, in, in how you did it. It and, is. And it's gotten completely mangled in the process. And I think it's also because we don't have a good, we've never had a really good champion of it, of, of helping people interpret it either. You know, here's the funny thing. If you'd got a group of teachers and gave them enough time to work on it and said, what do you think kids ought to know? It would probably wind up being pretty similar. If you look at what the, they did in Texas with the teaks and what they did in, didn't Florida make their own version of it too? Uh, every, almost every state that has made their own version. So here's the thing. I have a presentation on digital literacy where the whole thing kind of revolves around memes. And one of the things I like to point out is when you're talking about memes, you're talking about inf presenting information in a visual format or using multimedia to supplement and accentuate the things that you're saying and so on and so forth. And also understanding other people's stance and points of view. It's all right there in the Common Core. And I can show you exactly where in the Common Core it is. When I go to Texas... I can search the same phrases and find the same standards. They just have slightly different reword, you know, reworded slightly differently. I go to Florida and it's pretty much the same kind of stuff. I go to somewhere else. It's pretty much the same. Yes. They've all made their own little tweaks. They put their own stamp. They have their own logo and so on and so forth. But the reality is this is stuff that we think they do in show. Yeah. My yeah. feeling about standards in general is like put them out there, let teachers interpret them. I think teachers generally teach to those standards, you know, whether they, they're trying to intentionally or not. Um, and, and give some teachers some room so that they can be creative because that, that seems what's being sucked out of classrooms these days is, is more prescriptive kinds of teaching. Uh, you know, I think it really depends on where you are, but I know in yeah. some places it's much more tied down in what, what's expected of you. Tor Tori, you know, first of all, thank you once again for bringing that up. Don't, don't say sorry for bringing up common. It's because what you're asking isn't necessarily just about common core. What you're asking is how do you teach, how do you do an in-service on something that teachers need to know about and be able to uh, incorporate into their instruction or to be able to, if nothing else, be able to say, yes, I've done this or no, I haven't done this. You know, the accountability factor is there, whether you like it or not. The accountability factor is there in some way, shape, or form. So as somebody who may be responsible for imparting that information or getting people familiar with it and so on, how do you do it? I think it's a perfectly valid question, and we could replace the words common core with any number of things. To that end, the same stuff that you guys described at the very beginning when you know there's an element of self-selection, when there's an element of practicality or personalization, when there's an element of active learning and so on and hands-on and so anytime you can get that kind of stuff and, and getting people to feel that sense of ownership I think you're halfway there you know what I mean then all of a sudden you're not being forced to drag people along they're going to push themselves you know what I mean uh, and the more responsibility you give them the better off you are you know what I mean? If you give some people, the people who are the detractors from Common Core, and you give them and say, listen, do me a favor, research the heck out of this, and then give me a, you know, a one hour or a half hour presentation on all the things that, the reasons why you think the Common Core is inadequate, not why you don't like it, but what do you believe that is different from what is actually there, let them. You know what I mean? To me, that's a great conversation. At the end of the day, we're looking for shared vision, right? And the way we get shared vision is sometimes by disagreeing and coming to consensus and, you know, hopefully respectful consensus. So. Yeah, because I think, I think that's we're not going to be able to get away with from having to deliver PD that is not that exciting. So how do we, how do we, I, I, I think this is really good advice for taking something and making it a little bit more palatable. 
Yeah. Uh, Mary is saying something about that, how, how to engage resistant or fearful people. The f- first thing you understand is nobody is resistant or fearful because they just want to be. They have a reason. They have a reason. They, they may have very, very good reasons. When I was uh, the director of technology, there were some teachers, and I'm not even exaggerating at all, I got a phone call where somebody says, on my screen, it says, click OK to continue. What should I do? I, uh, I didn't exactly. I, I thought I was being punked. Here's the reality. There are some teachers that are terrified of their computers, and they're terrified of for two reasons. One, I mean, there may be maybe more than two, but two in particular in my mind. One, um, they're old enough to remember when you could absolutely ruin a computer by dragging the hard drive to the trash, where it was just that easy, and then they would be berated, mocked mercilessly, and, and so on and so forth. Two, nobody likes to look stupid. And when something doesn't work, when they have troubles, if they can't figure out how to log in, if the website doesn't work and so on and so forth, then they look stupid. And they look stupid either in front of their peers or in front of their students or both. And nobody wants to. And a lot of times that's why they're resistant. Another reason why they're resistant is they know that this is the flavor of the month and this is the administrator of the month. And then in a couple of years, the department of education is going to change or the state of Illinois is going to change their requirements or park is going to get replaced by map or common core is going to get replaced by this and so on. And they're just burnt out on it. They're just burnt out on whatever that flavor of the month is and they don't want to get involved. Once again, the way that you handle those kinds of things is to make them feel a sense of ownership or feel empowered with those teachers that were terrified that we could remember how to ruin a computer by dragging the hard drive to the trash. I remember bringing in, um, doing a, just, an inside risk just for sort of those people that I felt were a little bit more fearful where I brought in a iMac that I had unplugged the keyboard, unplugged the mouse, unplugged the power cable and had the computer just sitting on a stand. This is back when they were like blueberry flavored and orange flavored and so on, purple flavored. And I literally just said, here's a computer in pieces. Get it going. Try. And they literally had to look at a USB cable and say, what shape is this? And is that shape somewhere on the computer? And plug it in and look at the power cable and plug it in and then turn it on. And for some of those teachers, that was literally the very first time they had ever done that. The one thing I can tell you is, those teachers didn't call me for support when their computer wouldn't turn on because it turned out the cable was loose in the back anymore. They knew, you know what I mean? And they were able to feel good about it. They were able to understand it. They weren't felt like they were going to be demeaned in any sort of way. And it was hands-on and it was practical. They saw the value of it. They were able to be successful. It's one of the reasons why I love doing the mixing in some of the more serious PD with things like Blabberize or like Padlet, you know, these, some of these web tools. I know that we can all sort of throw stones at tool sessions and say they're so low brow, they're so low level, and there's so much more and we should focus on the pedagogy. But I will tell you this, a teacher that is more uh, le- or less tech experienced, maybe on the more seasoned end of things, maybe a little more fearful than others, when they feel like they can do something that is ridiculously cool, that their students will be impressed about, that's sort of like this magic trick, and especially when they can do it, be successful, and then turn around and show it to somebody else, that's powerful. That's motivating. That gets them to buy in. And if you give them enough of those little treats, if you will, then they're going to trust you when you start bringing in more of the heavy-hitting stuff. You know what I mean? Build on success. Build on simple stuff and just keep in mind, if they are resistant, if they are lethargic, if they are dragging their heels, they're that way for a reason and a very human and valid reason. And when you start looking at it from their perspective and you try to figure out what that reason is, then you can overcome it and get them past it. Yeah. That's awesome. That is like perfect. I think this is like the best advice we've gotten. I mean, we've gotten great advice from everyone, but this is really timely and perfect. Um, Steve, I, we want to let you go because you have kids that you have to tend to and we all are, everybody has to get ready for tomorrow and that sort of thing. Give us, how can we contact you? 
where can we find you next? Give us a little bit of a plug about what you're up to, that sort of thing. So um, this is sort of a going to be a, one last little bit of advice um, that uh, that isn't necessarily related specifically to what we've been talking about, but for each of you as you go forth and go forward, if you want to find me, search Teach 42. And search Teach 42 on anywhere. Do it on Twitter. Do it on Facebook. So send an email to steve at teach42.com. Or if you can't remember that, do it at teach42 at gmail.com or teach42 at teach42.com or any combination therein. Go to the website, teach42.com, and there's a contact me there. Um, and so on. Or you can actually search for my real name, Steve Dembo, and you'll find me also. But I strongly recommend uh, that you brand yourself in some way that you make it very, very, very easy for people to find you, and that you don't, you don't, don't make people work for it if somebody wants to reach out to you. I cannot tell you right now how many people who I go to their website and they make it incredibly hard to contact them. They don't have an email address. They don't have a phone number listed there, and I can understand for privacy reasons concerns why you might want to but then you have at least some sort of a web form now here's the thing i will point out to you most people don't trust web forms most people when they fill out a web form they assume it goes somewhere off into the ether and you'll never hear from somebody again so if you're going to use a web form as your main thing you need to add a paragraph that says this is how you can get in touch with me it goes into my inbox i will see it immediately i promise trust you know, and so on and so forth but there's a lot of people that i go to that i want to work with and I go to their web page, and there's no way for me to contact them. You look like you're about to raise your. Oh, I wasn't sure if you were raising your hand because you wanted to jump in. No, I was just looking at Laura's comment about Russia, and I didn't know where that came from. Sorry, Laura. What were you, What did you mean about Russia? Oh, the web form. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah. So so anyway. You can follow me on there. I don't blog or broadcast as often as I would like, but when I do, that is where it goes. Um, I do a lot of presenting at conferences. I do a lot of working with schools. That's really where my passion is. I love I love working with teachers. Um, I love working with those reticent, the teachers that drag their feet. Those are my favorite teachers. I love working with school board members that don't see the value of technology and education because they will. You know what I mean? Like, they, 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 they just don't know enough yet. You know what I mean? Are you so, going to be at ISTE? I will be at ISTE. Yeah, I, I think I'm doing, um, I think I've got like four, four sessions maybe. That's good, because it's hard to get accepted at ISTE, so that's great. I, I, tend, I tend to get pr pretty busy. Um, I, I try and be pretty busy at ISTE. So um, I've got, you know, a maker session and a uh, 3D printing one. And me and Adam are doing, uh, me and uh, my co-author, uh, Adam Bello, are doing one on uh, entrepreneurship, um, which I'm kind of excited to dig into. Um, that, that, that Honestly, I mean, this is just a little bit of advice for all of you also. I mean, honestly, uh, my, my conference strategy tends to be if there is a topic that I really want to know more about, I submit it to a conference. And I say, this is what I'm going to talk about, and this is all the stuff I'm going to do. And if they accept it, then I have no choice but to create it. You know what I mean? This is my, my I, don't, I don't have a PhD, but this is how I do my research, you know? <laughs> I typically, also when I go to conferences, or at least when I, when I was younger, I would pick a theme, like, what do I want to really want to learn about and really want to dig into? Was it podcasting? Was it blogging? Was it, uh, you know, whatever it is, and, and, and kind of pick things ahead of time in the conference schedule Yes. and have backups because ISTE is so big and overwhelming and a lot yes. of sessions get filled up or you can't find them and you don't get there in time or something. So really, if you're going to come to the conference, plot out what you're doing ahead of time because it's it's going to be exhausting. Um, and it's really hard at the end of one session to grab the book and figure out where you're going next and, and then to actually get – I totally agree. Have a plan for what you want to go to and what sessions you want to get to. Have one or two backups, and then be perfectly comfortable and happy abandoning that plan when something magical happens. The, one of the best things about SD or conferences like SD is the serendipity that can occur if you – so open yourself up to it and allow yourself don't don't feel pressured to have to go to a session you know every time you, find somebody, you run into somebody you haven't seen in a while or 
there, there are also a lot of informal learning things that go on. So for instance, before the conference actually starts, my partner, Steve Harganon, um, does something called Hack Education, and it's an informal kind of unconferency thing Saturday afternoon. There's also a badging conference that I think is separate and that costs something on Saturday. And then there's this party called, I don't know what it is, a Hack Education Party that's totally free and a great networking thing Saturday night. Then yeah. Sunday, we do our Global Education Day, but there's other stuff going on. Like, I think these crowdsourced kind of Ignite sessions are going on that day as well from the ISTE organized. Um, and then there's also playgrounds. So there's a STEAM playground. There's like a video distance learning playground. There's an ADE playground. There's a Google playground. And that's more hands-on, and you can talk with educators who are using whatever the theme is. Um, so if you can't get into a session, do that. Also, people really love the poster sessions at ISTE. Um, after the opening keynote, there is like a global poster session with, and they have food and drinks and everything in the reception after the opening keynote Sunday night. And we're, Steve and I are usually at that. But there's tons of other people who have done global projects or are from global organizations in that room typically. Yep. Um, and there's other poster sessions going on throughout the conference, and people love those. And if you decide you want to present one year, those are a really good way to get started with presenting because they, they accept a lot of people for those and it's not so high pressure as doing a regular presentation. Yep. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, they, they release the stats every year. The standard regular, what they call lecture is the hardest way to get in. Uh, the posters are actually yeah. posters and workshops are the path of least resistance. 24% of, of, of regular general session per, per sessions get accepted. Something like there that. There you go. Yep. So yeah, no, definitely, it, it, it's well worth it. And like it, like she was saying, you know, the playgrounds and the lounges and so on. Spending time in those is absolutely worthwhile. And I will also say, um, don't be shy about introducing yourself to anyone. If you see somebody wearing a shirt for a product that you like, go up and say hi because it may be the person that invented it. A lot of, like, for example, we mentioned Padlet. Um, they're still small enough that it's not worth it to them to get a booth. So he just comes to ISTE and hangs out. So if you go to like the bloggers lounge or some of these other lounges, he'll be there wearing a Padlet shirt. And he's literally the guy that coded the whole thing. And he's just hanging around on the sofa and, and they, talking to people. And they want to talk. Yeah, they absolutely want to talk to teachers. Uh, yeah, ISTE's booths are really crazy expensive. One company I work with, uh, I think it's, I, I'm trying to think how much they spent, but it was <coughs> come out and they're not doing a booth this year. And yeah. they're looking for alternative ways to get, get involved with things. The last thing I want to say to you guys, too, is all the people that we've met during these webinars this quarter, um, you know, think about how you're building your professional learning network and find Steve on LinkedIn and, and Gary on LinkedIn and connect with them. That's another way of kind of building up your, your social capital within the ed tech community is to get, you know, get connected on these on professional social media as well as the, you know, Twitter and, and, and uh, Facebook. But I would really recommend like you guys going and finding some of the people that you've enjoyed this quarter and connecting with them on Facebook so that you guys can keep in touch too. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. All right. I don't, want, I, well, I don't want to keep anybody too much longer. If you want to save, the, I'll, I'll post the chat and the video um, to YouTube uh, hopefully tonight. But if you want to grab the chat too, by the way, you can go underneath the chat window, you'll see a more button and it says um, save chat. And, um, and you, you can save it to your machine without me having to save it for you and send it to you. So if you want, we, lots of good resources in here, everyone. And I've taken some notes too um, about some of the things that Steve pointed out. And I'm, we're so lucky to have you, Steve. So thank you so much. Oh my gosh, my pleasure, I absolutely. Yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, if you do have more questions, you want to follow up, or if you just say, I, like you said, I need to teach something about this, and I'm just looking for inspiration, honestly, I, I'm happy to geek out with you and just throw some things against the wall and see what sticks. So it, It's about professional generosity. I think you'll find some people who are more this way than others, and it comes back to you, and, and that serendipity happens, like you mentioned before at ISTE. Because if you put yourself out there and you connect to people, you never know what's going to happen. And it's yep. often very delightful. So, yep. uh, Steve, if I can ever do this to you, do this to you or do this for you, <laughs> your classes, I'm happy to reciprocate. And um, I really, really appreciate you being here.
And thanks everybody for sticking with us a little bit longer than normal, but I think this is an incredibly valuable conversation. So once again, thanks Steve Dembo and Thai 575 students. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.